In this video, we're going to introduce the concept of loops inside of programming, and we'll look at a few different kinds of loops that you can use. And then finally, we will create an example inside of Unity where we can use loops to do something meaningful. So there's a few different kinds of loops that you will have available to you, and each of them have their own little pros and cons. In the end, you're going to mostly end up using a for loop just because it's very efficient and very powerful. But there are some scenarios where you could use something like a for each where you just want to do something very simple. While loops can also be very useful, but I would recommend if you're new to programming to stay away from while loops if you can until you get a little bit more familiar with programming just because this can create infinite loops pretty easily. So just be aware of while loops. So let's go through these one by one. The for loop is going to be your most common loop that you will use. The reason is because it's powerful and it's very efficient. Now, the downside of a for loop is mainly just readability. It's, it's very easy to misinterpret things inside of a for loop because it's using a lot of specific and technical syntax. So just to verbally talk through a for loop, we are giving it a starting point. So in this case, int i equals zero. So i is gonna be the thing that we're tracking. And as long as i is less than a number, and this is our condition, then we will continue to loop. And then when our loop is done, we are going to increase i by a certain amount so that we can then test it again and then make sure that we're still meeting our condition and then change it and then do it again and then change it. And that's the basic way you can think about a for loop. A value to track, in most cases, we'll use i for index, a starting point, a condition, and then a modifier. We also have a for each loop, and for each loops are very useful if you're looking to do something very simple to a grouping of objects. So if you don't need to track any kind of order or you don't need to do anything complex in those objects, then for each loop is very readable and um, very clean. So in this case, let's say we have a group of things and we need to do something to each of those things. We will grab one, do the thing, and then put it away. Grab the next, do the thing, put it away. Grab the next, do the thing, put it away. You'll know we're not really tracking order here. Um, we're just doing something to each of the objects. And that's how the syntax reads as well. So in this case, if we have something called an array, which is just one kind of collection, but a grouping of objects, we say for each thing in the grouping, do something. And we could call number dot run a method or whatever. Um, but that's the way to think about it is you just have a batch of objects and you need to do something to each of those objects one by one. And finally, a while loop is if you want to continue to loop while a condition is true. Now that sounds very simple in concept, but if you think about it in practice, if you were to do something like this while is active, your current point in the code is just going to continue to cycle here because we're never really leaving this, right? We're, we're gonna trap ourselves in our code. So while something is true, that's always gonna be true. We're just gonna print this forever and our application will lock up. So if you are using a while loop, one way to catch yourself from getting caught here is, is to add some kind of change or some kind of increment at the end of your while loop. So you can say while number is less than five and then you'd say number plus one, do it again, number plus two, number three. And at some point it won't be less than five. That's one way to break out of a while loop. Another really handy place to use while loops is if we're doing any kind of coroutines, which is where you can leave a method and then return and then do more stuff and then leave and then return because then you can catch yourself from getting caught inside of a while loop. Just be aware that this might be a little bit more advanced and how to use properly and you don't really need to worry about it yet. In almost all cases early on, you can get away with a for loop. Now let's look at an example of how we can utilize a loop inside of our Unity scripts. So if you need to clear anything out just to get an empty scene, make sure you do that. And I'm just starting from main camera and directional light. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to create an enemy and I'm gonna have the enemy print an attack statement and then I'm just gonna loop that. So maybe these enemies can attack multiple times in a row. 
maybe this particular enemy has a an ability that allows them to get multiple attacks per turn or, or just or something like that. So first we're gonna do is we're going to create an enemy. I'm gonna create empty. We'll call this enemy. I'll just save it. I'm going to zero this out. And just to start contextualizing some of this, in a real game, we would have a visual for an enemy. So I'm just going to make a child object is what it's called, where you have an object and you right click and you go to 3D. Let's just give it a visual, some sort of mesh. And you'll see that we get this little drop down. We're making this a child of this game object. So this would be the parent, this would be the child. And now if we move this object around, then the child follows. So one common practice inside of game development is to have some kind of root object where you can put scripts. But then as child elements, maybe you have a sound emitter or you have a uh, 3D mesh or a particle or whatever. We're going to start setting our stuff up this way. So we have our enemy on our root and you can just ignore this for now. Our enemy needs attack behavior. So let's just create a script for the enemy. We're going to create and we'll create a new C-sharp script and we'll call this perform attack. And on our enemy, we're going to drag and drop our script. So now our enemy game object has the perform attack behavior. So I'm going to double click and open up the script. And inside of the script, let's think about what we need to actually do the attack. In this case, I wanna know the number of attacks. Since we're gonna use our loop, how many times will this thing attack in a row in order to perform the attack? And we're gonna expose this to the designer. So as a reminder, that is serialized field, and this is an integer. An attack is a whole number in our case. So let's call this attack actions, and we'll put this at three. If I save and I come back in, you can see it exposes to the designer, so that is what we want. Come back in, our script. Normally you would want to trigger the attacks based off of some game condition, like if it's the enemy's turn or they're close to the player or whatever. In this case, we're just testing it out and prototyping, so we're gonna put this in start. And inside of start, we want to perform our attack. So we're going to create a new function called attack and beware of autocomplete here. And then we're gonna make our custom method down here. Okay, attack. So this is where we can do our loop. So we're going to do our attack and start. Anything that has a script attached to it will perform this attack. We're gonna use our for loop because we want to repeat attack for the uh, number of attack actions. And so to use our for loop, we could just type this in and I could consult the the document and you know figure out what the syntax is. If you're using Visual Studio, I wanna show you a handy shortcut where if you type in four and you press tab twice, like that, it'll fill in all this stuff, which will save you a lot of time. You could just type this in as well. It might be good practice to start learning this by typing it in, but we're going to declare a new local variable called i, and this stands for index and it's just shorthand. Um, we could rename this if we want. And we are assigning it to a starting value, which is gonna be zero. Next, we have our condition, as long as i is less than, well, this doesn't have any meaning right now. So let's figure out what, what to do here. If i is less than the number of attack actions, then we want to continue the loop. So we're actually gonna double click that, copy, paste. And so now we will repeat this loop three times. And then when we get to the end of the loop, we're going to increase i and then run it again. And we're gonna keep running it until this is no longer true, and then we're just gonna continue on. So inside of our for loop, just to test this out, we'll say debug.log, let's just put in a statement here, and then we'll also print the index just to make this really clear. So we're just gonna say whatever i is in this current loop iteration, print that out, and then just leave a note for ourselves. This is where we could do attack logic if this were a bigger system right, like dice rolls and whatnot. All right, let's save it. Let's come back into our scene. So remember, our enemy has our perform attack script on it and we've given it three actions. And so we should see the attack happen three times. We're gonna save it. 
hit play, go to console, attack, index zero, attack, index one, attack, index two, and then we no longer enter our loop. And I'm printing this index just to show you that we are counting from zero. Technically, you could start your index at one like this. And I'm gonna show you if I save it, get out. You see how we're only attacking twice? That's because we start off at one, increase it two, then we test it again, increase it to three. Three is not less than three, right? It's equal to. So that's the common convention is to just leave it at zero and just get used to thinking about counting from zero if you're talking about indices or indexes. I recommend that you use this format, but you could change this to whatever you want. Now we could say something like i equals one and we could say less than or equal to like that if we want. But you see how the more we kind of change that around and, and that would work and probably print more accurate statements. But again, if you're going against convention, then sometimes it's harder for other people to read your code. I'm just gonna change this back. Get used to reading this because this is the most common way you're gonna see a for loop. So hopefully that makes sense. If, if you want to repeat any action multiple times and then have some kind of logical control over it, then you should consider using a for loop or possibly even the other loops that we mentioned here. But this is just one way in which you can utilize it inside of your code.